Percy Fitzpatrick Ornithology Institute, Institute of Ornithology. Um, as an ornithologist and conservationist, his research focuses on understanding and managing conservation issues. Talking tomorrow, so I'll, I'll talk about okay. the Raya. So we'll just move straight on. Thank okay. you very much for, for kicking off. Yes, thank you for, for being here despite the traffic. So I'm going to tell you a bit about bird nests and, and how I see them as a resource to other animals, basically the animal community, but also uh, more broadly to other organisms as well. So I started my, my studies uh, in Pretoria. I'm a Pretoria boy. And, and in my undergraduate studies, this was really emphasized in, in my ecology kind of theoretical basis. So animal ecology is really focused on these negative interactions. You have things like predation, competition, parasitism, uh, which really have structured our thinking about how we see uh, animal communities in general. And it's, it's really, you can see it in the literature. A lot of people are very focused on these kinds of interactions. And this has been coined the, the battlefield ecology paradigm. And it maybe comes from, from this idea of natural selection, you know, survival of the fittest. Everything is competing out there. But uh, after my undergrad in, in Pretoria, I went to Finland, actually, for my master's and my PhD. And over there, I got involved uh, in, in a very nice group. And we did some field experiments. And we had these, this is just a forest patch in the boreal forest. So these are two patches. And there's these resident titmice that, that live all year round in these uh, boreal forest patches. And what we did is we, in half the patches in our study, we removed the residents. And we put some of them in these other patches. And we basically created this landscape of forest patches, some of them completely empty of resident species, and some of them with high densities of resident species. And then the idea was to see where would these African migrants that are coming in the spring to the boreal zone, where are they going to select to, to nest? And now, of course, these African migrants we're talking about eat exactly the same food as these resident species. So we're thinking in this battlefield kind of paradigm, the, the idea was very clear. So where do you think they're going to go if they have a choice of where to breed? Probably to this yeah, enemy free space over here. But what happened, actually, was the migrants came to the north. And what they did, on average, was to rather select the sites with the resident species. So they actually avoided this enemy free space. And this was termed heterospecific attraction. And the mechanism for this is thought to be that these residents have very good knowledge of the local environment. They have a lot of time to collect this information. And then these African migrants come in just for a short, brief spell of two or three months in the north. They use these residents as cues for where the best quality forest patches are. So this really changes our understanding of things. We completely expect competition to be structured in these communities, but it doesn't seem to. So if you think about it, this really alters our predictions for individual behavior. Instead of avoidance, there's attraction. And then it has bigger implications as well to community structure and even to population dynamics. 
So this kind of contrast in themes of my, my education kind of shaped my research going forward. And so my ongoing focus is really species interactions. And I'm really fascinated by this interplay of positive and negative interactions. And often these occur in, in context with, with enemies. So what we considered normal enemies, uh, I'm looking at this interplay of interactions. So just to briefly introduce my, my current kind of uh, research outlook, I do a lot on predator-prey interactions, both the positive and the negative, again, because there are some positive aspects. I do some work on uh, brood parasites and their hosts, but you're going to hear a lot about that on Friday from Claire, so I won't go much into that. And then what brought me back to South Africa, essentially, it used to be a, a, an escape from the harsh Arctic winters, was the sociable weaver system and these massive nests that we find in the Kalahari here in South Africa. And that's what I'll focus on later in this talk and talk about those nests in this environment. Um, so if you think about animals, right, they're master builders. And this is one of the classical examples of these beavers uh, that build these dams in, in rivers in the north. And they really completely change the, the ecosystem. They create a whole new habitat. Instead of a flowing stream, you now have a stagnant pool. And this creates a lot of habitat for a range of organisms. And they've been termed ecological engineers. So this is something which has gained a lot of attention in the 90s. And it's kind of been in the literature ever since, but has gone through some uh, periods of inactivity, let's say, in, in re active research. But basically, ecological engineers uh, are thought to create habitats. So they, they build often something. They modify the resources, like those beavers, you know, uh, change the availability of things. And it's thought that they have a disproportionate impact on the community or the ecosystems around them. The exact threshold of what is disproportionate is still up in debate uh, in the literature. But from my point of view, what's often uh, interesting about these ecological engineers is, of course, they're species in their environment, but they usually have positive impacts on biodiversity as a whole. And these uh, impacts are often through, a or through some facilitative mechanism. So they, they help other species establish in certain environments. Uh, so there's been some review articles in the last few years on identifying ecological engineers and investigating their impacts. And of course, we're bird people, so this was quite uh, interesting to me, looking at the, the publications based on, on different uh, taxa. So we have just a number of publications and then the different main groups, inverts, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And you can see birds have a very, very a dis a small proportion of, of studies uh, focused on their ecological engineering impacts. Mammals, on the other hand, these charismatic, generally large fauna, have a disproportion, disproportionate impact in the research, uh, despite them being relatively species poor. So this review basically produced a database. And there's only been, uh, they list 122 species uh, which have been identified as ecological engineers. And out of these, only 13 species are birds. So it's, again, a very, very small proportion of these species. Uh, the species that have been identified are the woodpeckers, which I'll tell you a bit about, seabirds, and then a, a few others. And you'll see the sociable weaver mentioned over here, and that essentially is on this list just because of one paper that I wrote with colleagues where we, we weren't really fully identifying it as a social weaver, uh, as an ecological engineer, but rather suggesting that it seems to form this kind of function in the Kalahari, and that's how it made it to the list. So there's really not a lot of research as, about birds as ecological engineers. But we know birds are master builders, so if you just go into your gardens out there, you'll see a lot of incredible structures. We in Africa, we are very fortunate to have these, these weaver birds very common in our gardens. Uh, but there's a range of, of species that build really fascinating nests. These are point out here, these oven birds, which is like a, a new world group that build often these mud ovens, uh, completely enclosed uh, nests. So we know that they build a lot of fascinating things, but we don't really know how they're used by other animals uh, in the environment yet once they're, they're finished. And I've thought about writing a review about this, and I've started this review uh, after putting this talk together about uh, six months ago. And I've gone through all these books which deal pretty extensively about bird nests and, and bird uh, reproduction in general. And you basically won't find uh, mention, really, of nests and their use after the primary use, which is the breeding of the birds. So this is really something which has been neglected quite a lot. One thing that hasn't been neglected is the woodpeckers or the cavity excavators. 
So we all know that you know, cavities generally get built by, by certain groups of birds, the woodpeckers being the most common, and, and that cavities are limiting. So especially in forested habitats, even in our bushveld habitats, uh, these cavities are limiting, and there's a lot of species that are called secondary <coughs> cavity nesters. So they, they need to use these cavities which have been created by other species. So these impacts are really known to, to create different species richness uh, in these environments. And there's, again, in the north, there's been quite a lot of studies on these cavities. And this is just taken from one study. Uh, this is just the number of nests that they were following. And this is actually years, so from zero to 17 years. And the different species that were used in specific cavities that were created in year zero, and then the different species that were used in them after that. And you can see that some of these cavities were still being used 15, 16 years after their creation by some woodpecker or primary excavator. So it's a really important resource for a range of other species uh, in, in these forested environments. So we also know that nest building is costly. Uh, if you just look at uh, our swallow nests, for example, these mud nests, it, it, I mean, they are fascinating structures, but, but it takes a lot of effort for these adult birds to build these nests. And it's thought that these, these cliff swallows, it takes about 1,400 trips to build one of these mud structures. So a lot of effort and care has gone into building these nests, but that's, of course, expected because they're going to raise their offspring. So they need a safe, secure environment for their offspring. Of course, they, they, they do sometimes uh, uh, fall down these nests and that, but generally there's a lot of effort put into building these nests. Uh, so they, they design. Their primary design is to keep uh, their offspring safe for the reproductive period. But because there's so much effort and energy taken to build these nests, we would expect that once these birds are finished with them, which in some passerines can be literally within a month, the nests aren't used anymore, we'd expect that other individuals of other species to use these, these very nice structures. And from these reviews, it actually suggests that those in-depth studies that do look at birds and their impact as ecological engineers, looking at this disproportionate impact, actually the impact of birds is often far greater than mammals in their specific uh, habitats or environments. Um, so that was me trying to start in this review process. And, and one thought, a kind of thought experiment I did was to look at a species I don't know much about, so monk parakeets. I, I know absolutely nothing about monk parakeets except for the fact that they build these very large nests, similar to our sociable weaver nests. So, so I thought, what is known about the species? It's, it's native to South America, but it's, it's moved across North America and Europe as an invasive species, and they, they cause a lot of problems in cities building like the social weavers do on power lines and this kind of thing. So I thought, you know, something must be known about these species. But when you go to the literature, there's some uh, details about how they host other bird, mammals, and insects. But these are essentially limited to only a few short observational notes. So small little uh, journal articles in general, but very descriptive, just describing, you know, we saw the species using this nest. So there's no actual quantifiable kind of measurable impact of these nests and how they're used by other animals. And actually, when I put the slide together, I thought it's a nice picture of a monk parakeet nest. And then when I presented it for the first time, I noticed these two birds over here, which are actually not monk parakeets. This is some other parrot species. And probably just from this photo, just the way they sit in there, it suggests to me that they're probably using or roosting or perhaps even breeding in this large nest. And this is probably a unique observation of another species using these nests. So it just shows you how much is, is left to be discovered about these kinds of nests. One fascinating thing about the monk parakeet nest is that they have this, this falcon species, which is often associated with them. This is a spot-winged falcon. And again, not much information is known about it. I only found two studies with some description of the use of these nests. But it's very fascinating from my point of view because of the, the sociable weaver system, which I'll tell you about later. OK, so again, if you scroll down Google Images, you'll see some other fascinating things. So monk parakeets often build on other nests. So here's Jabiru stalks, and the monk parakeets have built their massive nest on the base of a already big nest of a, a very large stalk species. So you can start seeing these nest webs and how one nest creates an environment for others which creates an environment. So things kind of go further and further. Uh, and then one last non-African example is essentially these uh, a study that was published in Ecology two years ago of, from a guy called Casper Delhi, who was traveling around South America, and he observed uh, these nests. So these are these oven bird nests. This is the national bird of Argentina, the Rufus hornero. It's their nest. But these are not 
Rufus Horneros fluttering around us. So Casper was, was on holiday, and he saw two different species. These are some martin species and house sparrow fighting very aggressively for access to this nest. So the Horneros had finished their breeding, and now other species were fighting for, for the use of this nest, just showing what a uh, useful resource it is. And he put together this very nice nest web of different oven bird, oy, different oven bird species, so you have different kinds of builders, all building very uh, interesting nests. And then a range of, of avian tenants, so species that are using these, uh, these nests. So this is really a fascinating natural history piece. And I think it uh, gave a good idea of how we should go about uh, looking at these nests and their lives after their initial use. So I think we need this broad approach uh, about looking at nests as taxa, uh, uh, nest as resource, and we should focus on a broad range of taxa, not only birds, for example. Uh, so I came up with a, some, some general thoughts about how nests are used. This one I won't speak about much, but you have these associations during use. I'll speak about it a lot uh, with the sociable weavers, but yeah, you have a simple greater striped swallow nest, and some parasitoid wasp species which has uh, put its larva in these nests. So, you know, something created an environment, and then some invertebrate is actively using these nests. Another form of nest use is, these, is nest usurpation, is essentially evicting a species from an already built nest. And we have a very nice example here in the Cape, in the Western Cape, of these black sparrowhawks that, that nest all around our leafy suburbs. Uh, but their nests are actively sought by, by these Egyptian geese. So, so the Egyptian geese, often once their nests are built, they actively evict the sparrowhawks from their nests. And then the Egyptian geese use these nests uh, to build on. And actually, the strategy of the sparrowhawks is essentially to build three or four, perhaps, nests in their territory exactly for this reason, because they're going to get evicted from some of their, from their other nests. So this nest is a resource to the Egyptian geese and potentially other species as well. We have uh, use after the primary builders, which is like that Argentinian bird example. This is uh, a hummercop nest, which there are some nests in Tableview, quite close to Cape Town. Uh, big structures, again, with a cavity kind of in the middle. Very common nesting place for barn owls and a range of other raptor species. And then if you look online, you can also find pictures of, of leopard cubs being, being cared for there or kept there while, while presumably the females are out hunting. So these nests, again, used after the primary builder has left. Another example from the Cape here is these bronze climbing mouse by Ditto Shudlius. All these nests in the reed beds that we have around Cape Town after the breeding season is finished, these climbing mouse seem to use these nests to raise their own litters. A secure environment, these nests are still intact for a few weeks, and these mice are using these nests. There's some evidence of uh, stealing of nest material. So of course, because this material is actively sourced, very specific, looked for, for specific qualities, uh, other species will come along and just steal the nest material because otherwise it's more energetically costly to go and find that nest material. So there's a lot of stealing in the avian world uh, and presumably with other taxa as well. And then lastly, there's this impact on the environment, on the surrounding environment. And one of the famous examples is the seabird colonies in the, in the Arctic or the subantarctic, creating, bringing all these nutrients, burrowing often into the, into the island surface and really creating a whole new environment uh, for a range of other taxa. And in, in some, in the Indian Ocean, there's an island archipelago where they've showed that the impact of these, these seabirds actually has direct impact on the coral reefs around the island. And if you take the seabirds away, you remove the coral reefs in, uh, indirectly as well because there isn't that nutrient impact into the ocean around the islands. So you can see that these nesting colonies, again, very, very important to the broader ecosystem. So the challenges uh, that I think we face in this field, we really need these detailed observations to create these nest webs to understand what's using what. We need to get some, to quantify nest use, quantify the importance, really get a handle on this, uh, uh, and then to see how these really affect individual species or communities as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of you know, interesting interactions out there with the nest builders themselves, if there's aggressive interactions or any interactions per se, but I think these would be very interesting. And then we need this multi-taxa approach, so not only focus on birds or mammals, but really incorporate the whole community, animal community as a whole, and even plants if you think about the nutrient impacts. So this is what I've tried to do in my research here at the FITS, uh, the study system which brought me here. Uh, uh, in the Kalahari, the sociable weavers. So, of course, they're very nondescript small birds. 
uh, that are endemic to southern Africa occur in uh, South Africa, a bit of Botswana, and then up into Namibia. But of course, the remarkable thing about the species is that they build these incredible nests. So probably the biggest built structures uh, by birds, possibly by, by animals more generally. Uh, uh, but one of these nests can host anywhere between 500 and 600 sociable weaver individuals. So if you haven't seen or if you haven't stood below one of these sociable weaver nests before, there's essentially a lot of chambers, up to 250 or 300 chambers that open down to the underside. There's a small passageway and then it opens into a little uh, chamber essentially in this nest material. But there's no tunnels or so inside these nests, they're essentially individual uh, chambers which each family group, it can be a pair but also a family group, use. But of course these nests uh, because they, they exist in this harsh environment, the Kalahari, we all know that you know, we expect a thatched structure like this to have certain buffering properties from this harsh environment. And these nests do seem to have that. Uh, so of course there's a range of nests that these birds built. They're very artistic. Here you can see an attempt by some social weavers to build a nest that looks like Africa. Uh, they, they got it a bit wrong down here. Well, West Africa especially, they, they went a bit crazy. Maybe they didn't have a picture to, to reference. Uh, but yeah, we are over here, South Africa, and my main study site, Tualu, is, is over here. But they, it was a good attempt, nevertheless. Um, so if you think about these nests and their buffering properties, here's just three days from a, a particularly cold winter that we had in our study site in 2012. This is just uh, the temperature on the y-axis, and then you have the time of these three days on the x-axis. And we had little data loggers placed in the environment and then also within the nest chambers of these nests. And here's the environmental temperature, so the ambient temperature fluctuating throughout the day. And you can see, oh, oh no, sorry. <laughs> ah, okay, so you can see the, the nighttime temperatures reaching about minus three, minus four degrees. So pretty cold uh, for small birds in a, in a generally hot environment. If you look inside these chambers, you can see a far more buffered environment. So on a particularly cold night here, the benefit of being inside one of these nest chambers is about 10 degrees, which makes a massive energetic uh, benefit to the individuals if they can access this resource. And of course, many species do try to access this resource, particularly for this reason. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but one of the main species, one of the obligate users of these nests is this a charismatic little pygmy falcon. So Africa's smallest diurnal raptor, about 50 grams, can fit nicely into the palm of your hand. Uh, and they basically overlap in their southern African range completely with the sociable weaver. So they exclusive users of the sociable weavers. They use it to roost in basically every night, and they use these nests to breed in uh, during their breeding season as well. And we've been following very closely the population uh, in, a, in our study area of these pygmy falcons. Um, there's a lot of literature on their benefits to the weavers. So, of course, we know snakes uh, are very active in, in foraging through these nests. And if you happen to share your nest with a pygmy falcon as a social weaver, they could be protecting you. So here's a pygmy falcon hitting uh, some s cobras off the nests and also chasing away other predators like slender mongoose. Um, this is not my footage, of course. We had the BBC visit us uh, two years ago to film the incredible interactions at these nests, and we've been fortunate enough to get access to some of their, their footage. So these, these falcons, they move into these nests, and there's been a lot of old literature talking about the benefits that they would give to the social weavers because of their protection that they can provide to social weavers. But of course, there's a more sinister side as well. Pygmy falcons are predators. Here's one going. You can see how upset the weavers are. Uh, the pygmy falcon goes to a chamber, probably just 30 centimeters from its own nest, and basically helps itself to a sociable weaver chick. So, so again, you have this interplay of positive and negative happening in, in this resource. Definitely, you know, give and take. Overall, my gut feeling, we're still putting the data together, but this, this falcon is generally like a parasite, a predator parasite, which causes great harm to these weavers, and they, they absolutely dislike uh, the falcon very much. And this is, but it's not uncommon to see this. So if you sit around one of these nests, they take, especially during the, obviously, the weaver breeding season, they take a lot of weaver chicks, but they'll also uh, attack adults, not often very successfully, but they do, they do attempt to prey on adult sociable weavers as well. So really love-hate relationship, yes. Yeah, some benefits, but I think mostly costs in, in the sense. 
but the pygmy falcons are actually not the only species which are exclusive users of these sociable weaver nests. There's some recent work now on these pseudoscorpions. It's called Sociochelifa. I assume in, in to, to match the sociable weaver name, so this unique genus of a pseudoscorpion that occurs only in the nest material of these sociable weaver nests in the Kalahari. So another like sociable weaver endemic species, essentially. And another one is this Plochiophilus, so a, loving, a weaver loving cockroach, essentially. Uh, and they also, there's a lot of feces, of course, at these nests. And these cockroaches exclusively exist on these social weaver colonies. This is just an example of a, a pygmy falcon nest. And they often have this uh, fecal mat that they have on their chamber. So it's very easy to see where the falcons are in a, in a nest, because they put these, this fecal mat. And these cockroaches, if you go at night, you can often see them feeding along these fecal mats at our colonies. But again, a species which is completely reliant on the social weaver environment, or this nest environment that has been created. So the main aims of, of the kind of research program at the study site is, is really to investigate the consequences of this big social weaver nest, also on the host tree, so how it interacts with the camel thorn trees that host them, uh, but then also how these nests are used by the Kalahari animal community. Is that right? um, and then basically asking this question, although it's already been identified in the literature as, a social, as an ecological engineer, but we're trying to still ask this question, is the social weaver an ecological engineer, and really understand the, and quantify the impacts on the environment. So the general kind of uh, setup that we have, which I'll show you um, many results for, is this. So we have a nice big camel thorn in the Kalahari with a, with a big weaver nest in it. And then we have very closely, usually within 100 or 200 meters, a, a very similar sized camel thorn nest, uh, a camel thorn without a nest. So it's kind of this comparison to see, we know these camel thorns are also very important in the environment. They give the Kalahari the structure, essentially. Otherwise, there'd be very few big trees. But what additional impact is there to this structure if you put a, a whopping big camel, uh, sociable weaver nest in the camel thorn? So first, to look at the nutrient impact. So all these birds nesting in these trees bring in all these nutrients from the surrounding habitats. So again, you have the camel thorn with the nest and camel thorn without. Yeah, we have uh, soil depth starting at 25 centimeters down to a meter. And then just the, the results for the nitrogen concentrations uh, of the soil below nest trees and control trees, and then in the, just in the grassland, in the matrix between the trees. And we have this kind of result. So at the surface, just in the first half a meter, essentially, you have a very large spike in nitrogen concentration. And this actually is the same for phosphorus and potassium, the, the kind of elements which are critical for plant growth. Uh, and this is about four times more nutrients under these colony trees than anywhere else in this environment. So you essentially, these birds are creating these enhanced islands of, of fertility. You have a landscape but then you have very clear hotspots of fertility in the landscape. And they're also probably depriving the rest of the landscape from all these nutrients, because they're actually bringing in all the seeds and then defecating below the nest. So they're really creating islands of fertility. So we know below this nest is now very fertile, but do the camel thorns and other trees that might be nested in, do they use these? Uh, and we basically used uh, stable isotopes, a signature kind of uh, approach, looking at the, the nice nitrogen uh, isotopes, uh, and found that actually there is a, a different signature in, in colony trees, so trees that host nests and trees that don't. And this signature matches that of the type of nitrogen or the isotope that the social weavers are putting into the ground below these nests. So, so they're bringing in the nutrients and the trees are using it. Of course, there are some costs to the trees as well, as you might know, massive branch breakages. These trees, these nests can be very heavy and they often do break uh, the branches. But at least there is some use of, this, of these nutrients by the host trees. Um, and then we've also looked at what this then means. Do they, so the trees take it up, but how do they use it? Uh, yeah, is kind of foliar mass per unit branch length. Essentially, how leafy the branches are in these trees. Again, control trees and nest trees. And this is what you find. So the nest trees much more leafy than, than the control trees. So they have access to these nutrients, they use them, and they seem to make themselves more leafy, about 27% more leafy in, in our samples. And what this actually resulted in, so I'm gonna show you a lot of animal use as well of these nests, but essentially this is one of our results. Uh, giraffes, if giraffes are feeding on, on camel thorns with weaver nests, they spend about three times longer in duration feeding on these trees uh, with the social weaver nests as they do in control trees without social weaver nests. 
presumably the mechanism here, or the reason here, is that you know, they get more leaves per bite, so it's more efficient to spend more time there. We still have to, to go into the details of this, but this is the kind of thing that can happen. And again, so for the tree, you know, benefits, they get in, they kind of get in these birds to source their nutrients, but then they might be, be, be having costs. For example, branch breakage. This is an old branch that broke because of a nest, but then also increased herbivory in that. Again, this interplay of positive and negative in this environment. Okay, so if we're gonna look at the use uh, of the social weaver of nests by animals. We've looked at it both temporally, so over time, across a year, and then also spatially, which I'll deal with at the end. Uh, and we looked at the range of taxes. So for birds, we do these night visits. For mammals and reptiles, we've either done counts from a distance or we've used these camera traps, like the giraffe example. Uh, and then for invertebrates, which I won't deal with much today, but we use a lot of pitfall traps and some aerial traps in order to sample what species are, are using these nests. So if you go to one of these nests, I said to you we go at night often. Oh, sorry, I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to, to my PhD student, Anthony. So a lot of this data is, is Anthony's that he collected as part of his PhD, which was handed in two months ago. We're busy waiting for, for the examiners. And you can see Anthony in his typical field gear. You know you've, you've raised a wonderful son if you'll be prepared to wear the jumper you sent him from the UK with a ridiculous <laughs> turkey picture on it. So, so he's a very sweet guy, but he, yeah, he hated that when I used this photo. But. Anyway, it's really, it's, it's his hard work that has collected a lot of this animal use data, so he's really done a great job. So if you go under these nests at night, you walk under and you look up and you expect to see social weavers in the chambers, but often you don't. You see something like the Acacia Pied Barbet. And another thing, if you ever do that, I'm always fascinated, so I walk under these nests and I, I tend to open my mouth, don't, because you will be defecated in. The, the social weavers often look at you, turn around, and, and defecate. So you just keep your mouth closed and you'll see wonderful things. So this is an Acacia pied barbet, very commonly used in these, these social weaver nests uh, during, during, for roosting at night. Uh, and actually we have a range of species, of bird species, that use the inner chambers. Uh, so we have ashy tits, uh, the, the barbets, of course the pygmy falcons, we have scaly feathered finches and red headed finches. Uh, and then also in some parts of the range, the, the, the rosy-faced lovebird. And some of these birds actually breed in the nests as well. The red-headed finch, the lovebird, and the falcon, of course. And some use it just for roosting. And there are other species as well that are using the inner chambers of these nests. Some black-cheeked waxbills, for example. And then the tops of the nests, which I won't deal with much here, are very often the sites of, of owl nests. You know, spotted eagle owl, barn owl, and sometimes larger raptors like pale chanting goshawks, black eagles, and this kind of thing. So these nests, again, serve as a substrate for a range of bird species. So if you get the chance one day, go under one of these nests very quietly at night with a headlamp, and you can see a range of, of species using these chambers. And we just kind of looked at uh, the colony use. How common is this? So this is just colony use over here and the different species. And if you just, in a single survey, essentially, this is the kind of uh, proportion of social weaver nests that would be occupied by the different species. So Acacia barber, definitely one of the most common users in our study site, Ashitits, the various finches and that. So, so there's a, every, on a nightly basis, there's a lot of these colonies that have been used by, by various species. Uh, we also wanted to look at how this changes across the year. We thought that, okay, the barbets are using these nests, but probably when the barbets go off to breed in their own cavities, which they usually nests, you know, you'd have a sharp drop-off in the use of the social weaver nest. So this is time, and again, this percentage for the different, or three different species now. But actually, these, this use of these colonies actually remains pretty consistent throughout the year. So there's, there's not some sort of seasonal thing where some, some of the species are only using it some of the year. There's generally, I don't know if it's floaters or what, but there's always bird species using these nests pretty consistently. Um, and then, just to look at some of the, the nest characteristics, of course, I showed you the Africa nest and, and another nest, but all social weaver nests are basically unique. They essentially, some are small, some are huge, and we try to look at the nest characteristics, and, and these nest characteristics do have an impact on what uses these nests. So this is just one, this is like the species diversity index for, for the bird species using the nest, and this is the size of the colonies. So as you would expect, as size increases, you have an increase in the diversity of species that are using a particular colony. So the resource of this nest becomes more important the larger the nest becomes. And other things like the height of the nest, the higher they are, generally the more species are using them. Perhaps they're safer the higher they are. But you, so very like small characteristics of these nests make them more or less suitable for some species. Um, of course, one other thing, you can watch this worm slung very closely, uh, foraging. For reptiles, again, these nests are very, very important. Uh, 
as a, as a resource. So especially during the weaver breeding season. Uh, sorry, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> no. So, uh, so that no students were harmed. That was just a, a video camera facing up. Uh, but yeah, so these, these snakes are often foraging through these nests, uh, especially during this kind of time now when the weavers are breeding. The Kalahari's just got good rain, and now the snakes, Wormslung and Cape Cobras especially, will be hitting these trees very, very hard. And they can actually empty one of these nests of, of basically all the chicks. So and that's where this, again, this pygmy falcon uh, protection can come in handy in this time of year. So we looked at a range of reptiles. One of the species we've looked at quite closely is the Kalahari tree skinks. Basically, it looks like your common house skink over here. Uh, but they're arboreal skink in the Kalahari, associated very closely with, with trees, usually camel thorns or shepherd's trees, these boskia species. Uh, and we looked at the numbers of individuals of these skinks on trees, again, without nests and with nests. So if you go to a tree, a camel thorn tree without a social weaver nest, you'll find on average, using our sampling protocol, about one uh, skink individual on average. If you go to a tree with a nest, suddenly on average you find about four skink individuals. So you can see again, there's this very strong attraction to trees that are hosting the social weaver nest, presumably because of some resources, but we think also for other reasons as well. Of course, the, the, the cut in, the, the, the other side of this story again is, is this. So you have your pygmy falcons, which are obligate users of these nests, but they're probably one of the main predators of these Kalahari tree skinks. So these Kalahari tree skinks are attracting, strongly associating with these weaver nests, but then their main predator is sitting there. And we, we thought, how do they manage this risk? So they obviously want to be there, but there is a, a very risky environment. So we've done some experiments uh, looking at that, and, and we thought there's probably a lot of information at these nests too. So this is a, a sociable weaver, and this is the common chatter of a sociable weaver, or a colony. So they're very social species, they're always chattering around like that. If a pygmy falcon arrives, they hate pygmy falcons. As soon as the pygmy falcon arrives, they'll sound like this. So to a stink, I mean to us it's very clear, definitely not thought to a stink, very clearly a sign, a, a cue, okay, something bad is coming, get out the way. So we think that there's a lot of information in these environments uh, around these nests as well. Of course, there can be 500 pairs of eyes looking out for predators. So if you share a predator with the social weavers, a very good place to be as well. So we've looked at the escape behavior of these skinks, uh, and we did little playback experiments. So this is the probability of skinks fleeing, and we've done control calls and alarm calls. So if you play a control chatter call, just the, the social weavers being happy, essentially the skinks don't run away. Some of them do because maybe it's a stimulus, but generally they don't. You play an alarm call and about 50% of the individuals will head and hide in, in cavities in the tree or in the nest material. So clearly they use these calls and these are at nests without social weavers present. So the nests are there but not the weavers individuals per se. So, so they really listen out for that call and then use it to make escape decisions. And you have a similar trend at non-colony trees, but much lower. So we think it's also a learned behavior in that those skinks that do associate with the weavers actually learn, OK, you know, this is an alarm call. I need to, to escape when I hear this alarm call. So again, these very nice interactions, the positive sides and then the negative side of their predator being present. And also their vigilance increases in these scenarios. OK, so just our camera trap information. Uh, so the, we have these two types of cameras. We have these ground camera traps that basically pick up all the large mammals below the trees. Uh, and then we have, we put up tree arboreal camera traps essentially to, to get the idea of, of the, the, the animals, the mammals using the tops of these trees. So you can see cheetah and a genet uh, using the tops of these trees. Uh, again, a lot of things going on. This is a, a baboon doing some exercise, I'm not sure. But we're getting a lot of strange things. Oh, probably after this photo was taken, the camera was taken down because they, they're very inquisitive in that sense as well. So this is basically the events captured at these, at these nests. So these are just the mean events, number of events per day, colony tree and non-colony tree. And this is for ground cameras. And again, so we have far more activity of mammals at trees with nest colonies. Uh, there is, of course, activity as well at other camel thorn trees, but not to such a great uh, degree. For the tree cameras, there's a massive difference. So almost no uh, animals picked up using these, these trees without nests. Of course, there are animals using them, but our sampling didn't detect many of them. Whereas in trees with colonies, a huge number of mammals using these trees. Uh, in Tuala, one of the more famous examples are the cheetahs. 
So this is not only one group of cheaters that are doing this all the time, but the, uh, the whole range of cheaters, and it might happen throughout the range as well, they often sit on top of these nests. And I'll show you a video right at the end where we ask questions of cheaters actually accessing these trees where the colony is to sit on top. Uh, of course, one of the more common behaviors uh, would be foraging, like probably that baboon, but then also sh using shade. So this is a kudu uh, using these, these nests as shade. Of course, a camel thorn tree provides a lot of shade, but again, you put a big whopping sociable weaver nest in there, and the shade becomes near perfect. So we looked at these kind of the duration of you know, the time they spend under these trees. So as, you, as temperature increases here, this is the duration uh, of the use, and this is animals in general. Uh, you have this kind of idea. So this is the colony trees. The duration at the time that they spent at the, the, the colony trees increases with temperature, whereas that's ac actually the opposite is true for non-colony trees. So this, you know, shading is one of the benefits, and they'll stay there for quite a long time. So these, these shaded sites become very important in the, in the heat of the day. And then the last aspect I'm going to deal with uh, is the spatial aspect. So, of course, social weavers are... Uh, site is over there, Tswalu, but social weavers occur throughout this range. And there's actually a very nice gradient here from pretty benign uh, up at Kimberley. There's a place there called Benfontaine, quite high rainfall, it's kind of a grassland, savanna uh, type environment. But as you move uh, westwards, you know, if you get into the, the Namib over here, this, these are extremely harsh conditions, maybe 40 millimeters per year, very little rain, very, very, very harsh environments. So the aridity gradient. And we wanted to investigate the stress gradient hypothesis. I'm going to get a bit technical now, but, but this hypothesis essentially uh, is looking at the balance between positive and negative interactions and how they vary along these gradients of abiotic or biotic stress. Uh, and the general thought is that as the environments get more stressful, you would actually have an increase in these positive associations or positive and facilitative interactions. So this has been tested a lot in plant communities, but actually has received almost no test in, in, in animal communities. And it's something we thought the, the sociable weaver nest would be a perfect system to look at. So basically, what we're trying to do is look at these nests and their impact on the environment in more benign uh, areas, uh, like Kimberley or even Tuolu to some extent, although it's already harsh, and then look at how this changes when things become really harsh in, in the Namib. And, and trying to see this, you know, this impact on, of habitat amelioration, this buffering of the temperature, creating resource availability, and how this would have impact this community resilience. And we really think that these nests could potentially have a very critical role in a, in a global change scenario as our deserts are becoming hotter and hotter. And I think Susie will speak to you about that uh, either tomorrow or the next day as well. So, so you'll see exactly how hot these deserts are becoming. Uh, so here's our temperature, uh, our rainfall gradient, sorry. And the idea with this is to look at how this interacts uh, with trees that have nests again and trees that, that don't. So looking at our, our reptile data again, so this is just the number of reptiles in a tree. And as expected, this is across the range, everything pooled. You have more reptiles in, on average using trees with colonies than trees without. Uh, but now we're trying to look at how this interacts with rainfall. So you'll have the colony tree with a red line and the non-colony tree with a dashed blue line, and you have this situation. So as rainfall increases at non-colony trees, at sites with higher rainfall, you have a higher species diversity or species richness, uh, a mammal, a reptile richness using these, these non-colony trees. But you'll see for colony trees, it's, it's actually quite stable across the range. So the difference here is very important. So at these very, very harsh sites in the Namib, it's actually maintaining a species richness which is equivalent to those at the higher rainfall sites. So we really think that these, these nests are creating this environment, ameliorating the harshness of the environment, and this can maintain pretty species-rich communities. Um, yeah, so, and this is the only invertebrate data I'll show you, but essentially we have a similar kind of trend in the invertebrate data, which is, is a data set that consists of thousands and thousands of invertebrates. But again, for non-colony trees, this blue line, you have this very sharp increase in the diversity at the trees with increase in rainfall at sites. But even at the very harsh sites with the, the colony trees, uh, it still maintains pretty high insect diversity. So they seem to provide this habitat uh, even in these very, very harsh environments. And then to go to kind of to round it off to return to this battlefield ecology paradigm theme, uh, I assume you're 
uh, familiar with like the niche concept. So every species, you have to, it's a bit abstract of course, but every species has a fundamental niche. You know, a certain set of elements or conditions that they can exist in, a habitat that they can exist in. So this is their fundamental niche, but usually we expect species to only exist in a subset of their fundamental niche. And this is because of all these traditional negative uh, interactions of competition, pr predation, and parasitism. So, so they provide negative influences, and that actually makes their realized niche smaller than their uh, fundamental niche. So that's the battlefield ecology paradigm. But when you start opening your mind to this idea of positive interactions and facilitation, this can change. So if you include, or if you think about facilitation effects, here's the fundamental niche again, but you can actually have a realized niche which is larger than the fundamental niche. And this is specifically because of these ecological engineering type effects where these ecological engineers can ameliorate the habitat conditions, you know, make it not as harsh uh, as it is. They provide predation <laughs> refuges such as the skinks and then just general resource enhancement. So we think these, these nests, well, weaver nests for sure, but perhaps bird nests more generally can, can serve this role in, in certain environments. So the take home message essentially for the talk uh, is to think of the social weavers as, as these islands uh, in the landscape, islands of diversity, islands of fertility, uh, and they're definitely a resource for several species. I think nests, especially some candidate species, could be quite similar in these environments. The interactions I think I've shown you are quite plentiful. There's a lot going on at these sites. You know, they become these uh, centers of activity and therefore there's a lot of very interesting natural history uh, interactions. Uh, these nests have multiple lives. You know, once they've been used by the primary species, they could be used by several other species over and over again. And then this last bit that I've showed you, this really critical role potentially in, in harsh environments and, and the, the importance of this potentially under a global change scenario. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And then these are some of the funders that have funded this work uh, over the last few years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So, so they, the weavers, of course, only breed under very good conditions. So especially what the Kalahari is experiencing now is, is several years of drought. So our site has that as well. It's been about three or four years of below average rainfall. So eventually, these colonies will also be impacted by this lack of breeding success. So of course, they need, they are long-lived species, the social weavers, but there needs to be some recruitment into these, these colonies. And if there is no water in the environment, eventually, yeah, there will, there will be this decline in the colonies. So we also have, there, is, there are dynamic systems, of course. So there is this death and, and birth of new colonies. But I think in this, these extreme drought conditions, yeah, it's just repeated years of drought, hot temperatures, which are creating some colonies basically to go extinct. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard there was in the Khalakhari. There is some in Tol as well. I think not as good as the Khalakhari, but I've heard that there has been pretty good in the Khalakhari. Yeah. But not, not huge rains, but at least something better than the last year's. So, yeah. Yes? Um, if you look at it in terms of, of symbiosis, where you have two species who can either be both support and positive attacks, only one of the species has positive attacks or both. And if you look at it in that term, and uh, as a social reason, that if all the interactions are uh, um, a pygmy falcon, it's on the one hand positive, for yeah. the weavers just to protect, on yeah. the other hand negative for predation. Yeah. If you look at all the inter interactions in all the different parties in the region, is there, are there more positive effects out there? So I think uh, overall, I think because they're creating this, this habitat, I think the net, the net effect is essentially positive. You know, the species wouldn't be using this, this resource if it wasn't positive. But of course, the exact, this interplay of positive and negative is very context dependent. So for example, in drought years, it might, some of those interactions might tend towards being more negative. Uh, others might tend to be more positive, for example. So you, you could have a scenario, if we think of the snake protection or the snakes predating and the falcons predating, if there's a, 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 
an explosion of snakes, for example, in a certain area, then perhaps the net effect for the weavers of having a falcon can actually be positive because then you know, the, the, the falcons are protecting from a huge number of snakes. If there's a, a very poor population of snakes in some years, whatever, and the predation risk isn't that high, you can actually, then probably it, it tends towards being a negative net effect. So it's, there's definitely this balance, but it's, it's context dependent, depending on the, the conditions in the environment, but potentially also the, yeah, the species, the abiotic uh, situation that's going on at that time. Yeah. So definitely there's no one answer. If somebody goes and does the study in a different year, they'll get some things which are similar, but then others will tend towards the other side of, the, of this interplay. Yeah. Yes, I'll start here and then. Yes. No, no, sure. So, the, yeah, so it's something I've been thinking a lot about. For sure, they. They, they are decades old. Claire's in the Benfontaine site, they've been following some colonies for 40 years, perhaps more. Uh, I don't know if you know of this Refoto South Africa project that Tim Hoffman runs. Uh, and I've been asking Tim, he's got these massive archives, and I've really been wanting him to find some of these old historic photos with Weaver Nest that we can go and s try and find the same nest. But I suspect, I don't know what the oldest, oldest one is, but for sure they 40, 50 years is nothing, and, and maybe even an older. But they are very dynamic. So even our biggest colonies, they'll go from 250 chambers in one year, and there'll be a lightning strike or a collapse, and they'll go down to 30, but then they build up again. So, it's, so there definitely are some very, very old ones, yeah. Yes. Yes. So I think the, the basis of that is they're, 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 they're burrowing into sandbanks. So, so you know, you have a sandbank. It can't really be used by many species, but then the bee eaters are burrowing in. And I think all bee eaters do that generally. And then that's creating a habitat for, for a range of species. So whatever study that was, they, they probably found insects that are using these chambers afterwards, mammals, and this kind of thing, yeah. Yes. The temperature difference in June. Oh, in noon. So there is a, actually I have a slide for, for the, 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 the daytime buffering. So then it's usually down to, it also depends on the exact chamber. So you have the central chambers are far more buffered than the outer chambers. But in, in the heat of the day, it can be about six, seven degrees difference. And we actually find if you visit one of these nests during the peak of the day or, the, or during noon, you'll actually find the weavers are going to likely be there. But even other species like barbets, uh, these other associates are actually using these chambers in the heat of the day. I think it's a good escape from, from these hot, hot temperatures. Yeah. Where was the next one? Sorry. And then I'll, yeah. Um, I see that one of the feeding functions was rain. What, what has been learned from the rigging of that? Okay, yeah. So we've got a whole population study on the falcon. So we follow about 35 territories every year. since. 2011 already. So, so the first goal was just to, yeah, to start to see how, how lo long lived they are. But with the, the main thing we find at the moment is this very interesting breeding system that they seem to have. So, so they, they, they have what people think is a polyandrous system. So you have one female with multiple males. So sometimes you'll go and catch a nest. In my first year, I catch a nest. And then I get, I, I get a male. I catch another male, and then I'm like, okay, I've got three males, and I still haven't got the female out the chambers yet. So, so we've, we've actually described this, the system, but it's not as simple as just simple polyandrous. So they, they have a range of groups, uh, which, which some of them are multi-female and single male, some of them are multi-female and multi-male, and then some are multi-male and single female. And then they also, the, the cooperative behavior we've, we've got a handle on. So these, a lot of their offspring are actually s remaining at their, at their territories for, for y one year, sometimes two years. So they help their, their parents. But then there's also immigrants. So there's, you have this mix of helpers, which are offspring of the main pair, but then also immigrants, which come from outside the study, which are unringed when we first get them. And, and they're helping as well. So we're still we're busy doing the genetic work at the moment, too. So we've got an idea of the social system now, but we're not sure what it means in terms of the genetic mating system and, and who's actually getting uh, their the genes into the offspring. Yeah. And then we're also looking at just the dispersal and dynamics between these colonies. You know, what they move a lot. So uh, a colony that has a falcon pair or territory or group uh, this year won't have one necessarily this year. Some of them do stay in the same colonies for five, six years, and others are moving around all the time. So, yeah. Put it up there. 
Yeah, so, so I have actually got a, a nest expert out here at, at once, but we didn't actually get to, to doing any detailed work. But, but my, from what I've seen, because we have seen some of our nests start from scratch, because there'll be a fire or whatever, or a big breakage, and then they'll start again at some, some new site ne very close by. But I think the normal kind of process is, is, is large.